Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitemout.com and P.L. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is March 6th. And in this video, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the sales coming up at Asia Week next week and a week and a half from now. There are a lot of sales. There's a stunning number of sales. We've uploaded, I think, 16 of them onto the uh, bookcase here over on the Bitemount web website. So you can come over and peruse them all you want. Um, and we uploaded them all in very high resolution because there's some great stuff in here. A couple of the catalogs, I think, are going to become standard references the way they've been doing them. And lots of information, really good stuff. Um, there's the uh, Fine Chinese Paintings Catalog, Fine Chinese Ceramics and Works of Art at Christie's. And these catalogs are filled with stuff. The Jungkook Collection. There's a sale at Bonhams. They've got some, some really good ceramics coming in. Bonhams also has a Japanese print sale. And then there's the Robert Youngman Collection of uh, Jades at Sotheby's, which is a very interesting collection. Um, with, a, with a long history going back into New England, uh, um, Robert Youngman was a descendant of Captain Robert uh, Bennett Forbes, uh, the famous sea captain that uh, uh, the collection now, part of it's in the PBD Essex Museum, and there's the, uh, the Forbes Museum, um, which is a standalone museum, a great one, down in Milton, Massachusetts. He's part of that family. Uh, and then there's Saturday at Sotheby's Asian Art. Uh, this is sort of a, 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 a sort of a, a price price sale for more average collectors, but there's some great stuff there, really good things. And then there's important Chinese art at Sotheby's. And then, then there are three terrific Indian and Himalayan and South, uh, Southeast Asian art auctions: one at Bonhams, one at Christie's, and one at Sotheby's. They've all got one. Okay, everybody got one this year. And uh, the amount of stuff that's coming up is just pretty breathtaking. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine. It's going to be a real test of the market, I will tell you that. But the, the material in here, uh, a lot of the stuff this time around is just loaded with provenance and uh, lots of uh, uh, old collections, okay? And lots of collections done in the last 50 years that were deeply... Uh, uh, deeply resourced uh, out of good, other good collections and then brought into new collections. It'll be interesting to see how they do. One of the sales that's going to be coming up is this, is the uh, Jerry Tang Collection Part 2. And uh, as you may recall, last January there was a sale at Sotheby's um, following the publication of the book on this collection uh, that was sold and did extremely well. We talked about it quite a bit. And uh, uh, this catalog is no disappointment. There's some absolutely fabulous stuff in here. Uh, you got you got to see, it. and it's all kung shi, which is, makes it really really interesting. And um, the first thing we're going to hop over to is uh, is uh, here. This this page is this brush pot. All right, uh, the brush pot in this is is the poem on it, the history behind it's uh, well written up in the front uh, in the front page uh, here leading into it. The research was done by uh, Yibin Ni, nee, who's a, a legendary scholar over in the UK, knows what he's doing, and uh, he researched the uh, uh, the print source, the picture source for this brush pot here, uh, back to the uh, Tang Dynasty. And there's a whole uh, long, very interesting write-up here about the Tang poet um, Wang Chang Ling, who was um, um, known for his, his uh, scholarly writings and was depicted here. And interestingly, this also has the apparently the name of has two seals on it signed, and um, one of them is the is where where the piece was made, which is really fascinating. Um, who, who, which kiln and Jing De Chen turned it out. And this is an extremely rare brush pot um, done in this style. And as you can see, this scene here uh, is very similar to the uh, print that he that was uh, sourced back on it, and it has to do with the whole uh, Tang scholarly impulse and uh, view of life and, and the world and so forth. But uh, it's worth reading going through it. I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. There's too much to cover. But it's a great brush pot, uh, fabulously well painted, and I, uh, I think the estimate's pretty reasonable. There's a blue and white one with script on it coming up in another sale um, that's not estimated a heck of a lot different. Um, and I think this is by far a more interesting example. Uh, great piece. I think there's only um, one or two of these brush pots known. All right, just a handful of them that are done in enamels, okay? And then over here, the uh, Font Hill vase is in this sale. This is that massive 29-inch Famille Rose uh, uh, vase. And what makes this really interesting is the fact that this vase was done at the very, very beginning of the introduction of Famille Rose porcelains into China, okay? It was the, the, this face was probably painted around 1718 or so, give or take a couple a year. 
uh, but here it is. And uh, th they were so successful right off the bat with this. It's, 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 it's astonishing uh, considering they were, this was a new color for them and they were just starting to work with it. And uh, it came out of the, the legendary Font Hill collection. Every once in a while, you'll see something that'll that'll reference the Font Hill collection. And the reason was was that this was a is a very wealthy British family that have this huge estate, and they have been collectors for for centuries. And uh, their name is last name is Morrison. And uh, this was one of the pieces that came out of Font Hill many years ago. It was sold, and uh, it's coming up now out of this collection. It's quite a thing. Quite, quite a beautiful vase, and uh, you should come over and uh, check it out. You, you'll find it interesting, okay? And then on to, um, this is a real rarity. There's only, I think, the next piece we're going to look at, <clears throat> there's only, um, I think, one or two of these in the world. It's an archaistic uh, multi-tier incense burner. And uh, down here is one that's done sort of in the Amari, iron red Amari sort of palette, the Kangxi, um, that's in the Palace Museum in Beijing. And this is the one that's in the sale. Okay, it's an underglazed blue one. It is absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's unbelievable quality done with archaistic masks on it. And it has a pretty reasonable estimate, 30 to 50,000. When you consider there's only a c couple of these known, uh, I think this is this is, a, is an opportunity for somebody. Um, these were considered real sort of uh, whimsical things um, for the Kangxi Emperor, um, as they were as they were based on much earlier uh, bronze types, and uh, they were considered very you know very much you know fascinating novelties of their day, and uh, we'll see how that does. It's a wonderful object, and then we're going to scoot along over to here the uh, massive and uh, very rare the, this Femi Ver banquet platter. Uh, there's a really interesting write-up on this, and this this is this platter is actually sort of a, a symbol of a cautionary tale of excef excessive, undeserved extravagance by the imperial courts, and it's based off of writings that began in the Tang Dynasty, uh, from the Tang Dynasty that led to the fall of. Um, uh, let's see here. It, it's written it, here. This is also it's another piece by Yibin Ni, and it, it talks about the um, uh, it's called the Romance of the Swain Tang Dynasties, and it was written by Shu Ren Ho, um, who was a Ming Ming writer. And, but he described the downfall of the Sui uh, Dynasty and the rise of the Tang, and uh, in it he, the, he there's a cautionary writings about it, exor the palace and the court. Uh, spending exorbitant amounts of money um, on on luxury and on wars and on on opulence when um, you, you, you're sort of forgetting about your people, and uh, so. It, it, but in the Kangxi era, they had lots of banquets and lots of things, but they made sure um, that they they upheld their end of the bargain with the people as much as possible. I guess is the way to say it. But anyway, this platter is coming up. This is a huge plate. There's only a couple of these known as well. Um, I think three or four, and uh, this is a very large one, 20 inches in diameter, lavishly decorated, and we'll see how that does. That that should be really fun to watch. Um, the estimate is around 100, 150 thousand, and uh, quite a thing. All righty, and now um, we'll hop over to um, this. This I'm pointing this out just because this is one of my favorites. Is this really interesting yellow ground uh, and, and underglazed blue dragon vase? I mentioned it in last week's w video just because I thought it was so terrific, and the estimate on it seems very reasonable, um, uh, fifteen to twenty-five thousand. I think this is a terrific object, and it, you know it, it may go for that, but I wouldn't be surprised to see it uh, sell for uh, for more. And there are other Kangxi. If you if you're a Kangxi collector. And, and you're not, you know, you're not in the ballpark for these high, very expensive things like the the uh, the Font Hill vase is estimated at you know three to five hundred thousand. And I, to me, that seems con uh, sort of low. But there's other porcelain in here that's estimated in the five to ten thousand dollar range that I've looked at. Uh, I had the good fortune of m meeting this man several times that owns this and saw his collection. Um, there's some other great examples in here that are you know five to ten thousand dollars. So you don't or three to five. I don't, you don't have to be a billionaire to buy this stuff if you're interested in collecting it all right and um, then lastly we're going to uh, let's see here hold on a minute uh, da, 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 da. Uh, 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 uh. oh this was the last thing I wanted to point out this is this is one of the pieces in this collection that I found really fascinating and very unusual and I'm not it's it's not something that uh, may jump out to you right away is this box 
It's a Chinese Kung Shi box, paste box. I and mean, you've all seen paste boxes around, okay? It's estimated at five to 7,000. It was sold by Marchant and Company. And what struck me was, was how much this looks like Nabashima. Um, you often think of uh, things uh, being made in China during the Chanqi period, late Wan Li, that was sent to China. And, but you don't see a lot of things coming back from China that were, uh, that were emulated in porcelain. And to me, this is very much like Nabashima. And I did a little poking this morning and went over to the Bauer collection. And uh, you see the same sort of patterning. This is a really fine piece of Nabashima. Um, if you don't know this website, it's, it's uh, the Bauer Foundation, uh, the Museum of Art over in uh, Switzerland. It's a great website. And, uh, but at any rate, to me, this, this is an interesting, interesting piece. Uh, it's estimated at five to $7,000, but highly unusual, highly unusual. So, um, you know, that, that, it's a good collection. We're going to see how it does. Great things, okay? And then on to this, Power and Prestige. This, this is an absolutely fabulous collection of European bronzes, okay? There are 11 bronzes in this catalog, including the cover lots, which are uh, extremely rare because it's a pair of these goo-form vases, all right? But we're going to slip along and come over to... Um, Let's see here, we'll go to page 12 to start, okay? Here's an overall shot of, of some of the examples in here. And one of the things that if you're a patina fan uh, and, and, and you're interested in learning about bronzes, this, this, uh, the, these 11 bronzes are a treasure trove of surfaces. Uh, if you really want to get in there and take a look at it, because copies of early bronzes are everywhere. And uh, in this catalog, the way it was done and the way they described gives you a real opportunity to, to see, uh, you know, fabulous examples from great, great sources. And, the, and, the, and all the provenances are in here. Some of these pieces of provenances going back you know, 100, 150 years. Um, but you can blow up all the images and get a really, really, really good look at the surfaces, which is very hard to do with um, uh, most catalogs. All right, and this uh, this catalog I think is going to become a, practically a reference book because it, it's so beautifully done. And uh, one of the lead lot, the cover lot in this sale, these Tzu Gu's, these are a pair of wine vessels. They're from the Shang Dynasty, and they have absolutely amazing colors on them. Um, if you take a look, uh, this one has sort of this rust brown surface mingling into green, and then the other one is a, a denser uh, patina, if you will, um, coating it, you know, that, that very thick green business going on. And there's, a, there's an excellent write-up uh, on these. Um, these were sold at Sotheby's in 1949. Then they were in the Luff collection, and then they went through Blewett and Sons, uh, to the, to the, and then on to the uh, present owner. All right. They don't say who the collector was. This is this is a, a, a an auction on the uh, without any provenance uh, named. I'm sure that there's there's a name you'll get if you buy one of these. But uh, uh, here it is, and there's a good write up, lots of detail in here. Um, the the way they're doing these catalogs nowadays is just fabulous with the information that they're providing um, for you uh, to to learn about them. Okay, and then over here. Um, there's this, this really, really fine um, Fang Ding. Uh, it's probably for late Shang or, or maybe the Yang, Yang period. But the, the surface on this uh, particular one is, 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 is perceptibly th d deep and thick and just a stunning. Uh, these food vessels, are just, they just get clad with surface. And this is one of them, all right? Uh, you should auto, you really ought to take a look at it. the estimate on this by the way is a million five uh, what is it a million to a million five something like that it's got a giant estimate but look at look at the look at the provenance on it um, uh, Hang Jun collection in Beijing prior to 1942 and then it was in another collection 1943 Edward Chow collection up until 1980. And then Sotheby sold it in 1980 and then the Chu collection and then it went through Eskenazis on top of it all right. That, that's, that's, that's uh, you know, really great background, to put it mildly, okay? And uh, the, the catalog uh, is, uh, is superbly illustrated, lots of multiple shots. Um, this, this particular piece they spent a lot of time on. And then there's this really nice uh, Fuji Li Ding, it's called. Uh, it's a food vessel. Most of these are food, ritual food vessels inscribed. A lot of them have been published. Uh, so if you're a bronze buff, this is a place to see some really, really great bronzes. 
Um, uh, and, and the catalogs will always be on our website if you want to come back to them. But <clears throat> if you like Chinese bronzes, this is, the, this is a great uh, a, a selection of nearly a dozen of some of the best in the world. And then you're going to hop over here to the, the, the Herbert and, and, and Florence uh, Irving collection. The Irvings were um, uh, an interesting couple. I mentioned last week that they, uh, Mr. Irving um, bought his first piece of uh, first antique during World War II. He rescued a piece of French glass uh, so it wouldn't be destroyed in the war. So the man had a good heart and an impulse from day one. Came back from the war and uh, uh, went into business, uh, worked unbelievably hard. There's a story about his life in here with his wife. And uh, they were as poor as church mice when they first started out. Uh, but they went on to build um, uh, Cisco, um, which is the giant food company you see around, the frozen food company. Um, that, you know, they're based out of New York. And he built it up into a, a massive company with his brother. and. Uh, began collecting with um, with abandon. <laughs> um, he lived to be in his 90s. He was a very old man. He very generous. Loaned a lot of his collection. A lot of his collection went to the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, their house was literally like a museum. Uh, there was an interview in here with him, and he, you can read it. It's a great, a great catalog. This is part one, by the way. <clears throat> part two is going to happen next week. I didn't know that, by the way, when I mentioned it in the first video. I thought they were going to do part one in the way they typically do it, part one Irving stuff this sale and then in the fall do part two. They're doing two parts right off the bat, and I don't know if there isn't more coming, but um, they, they, this was their house, and he liked the idea of living in, an, he, he seemed to like the idea of living in a house that was very much like a museum, so um, that's what they did. And this is he and his wife, and uh, she was a school teacher, an educator, very lovely person, also fascinated equally as he with this stuff. And um, their collection is, uh, uh, breathtakingly big and superb, and uh, the provenances on where they got things is uh, Spink and Sons, um, uh, 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 Rare Art in New York, all, all the best sources you could think of. This is where they shopped, okay? Uh, not a lot of auction house provenances on here, which is sort of interesting. One of the pieces in it is this. This is a, a, a late 17th, early 18th century Kangxi or so um, a, a cup, a white jade cup. But notice the, one of the things I noticed about all his jades, the color of the jades. He didn't not only, not only like just you know great carving, he also liked them, uh, especially if they had fabulous quality stone. And this is just an example of it with the chimera. And the carving on this is just stupendous. And it's on a, it looks like a Zetan stand. I didn't check that. Let me, let me take a look. Um, uh, da, 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 right on cup. Uh, boom, boom. Hong Mu stand. It's on a Hong Mu stand. It's very dark. It looks like Zetan to me. Anyway, it's estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars. He bought this from Spinx uh, uh, thirty or so, forty years ago, and uh, just a, a great, great object. And then we'll move along over to. Uh, I have a list here because there's so many pages. It's it's, it's a, a bit much. Is this is this early Han style uh, white jade uh, or or, or uh, 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 soft, soft greenish white jade vase pear shape just unbelievably beautifully carved it's mark and period it is inscribed he loved imperial stuff he loved imperial jades and uh, this is just a classic uh, stupendous quality um, and we'll see how this does it should do extremely well it should do extremely well let's push it back out here the estimate on this is 100 to 150,000. It's about seven inches tall, a little over seven inches tall, uh, but just great. And it is marked, and they have a picture of the rain mark right here. Okay, it, is, it does have a six-character rain mark on it, and uh, good provenance all across the board. All righty, and now over to number 70, page 70. Oops. This is an amazing collection. Is this? This is. One of the most, uh, one of the greatest jade bowls I've ever seen, um, with the twin fish on. It's a brush washer. There is a very extensive write-up on this. Uh, on the back of the on the back of this bowl um, is is an entire poem, done in gold, um, with Chin Lung seal. It's completely imperial. Uh, it's it, just out of this world piece of piece of jade. And um, there is an extensive, uh, as I said, write-up on it. They have, they have documents on where the poem came from. 
a beautifully footed, footed bowl. It's estimated at a million to a million and a half inch, uh, dollars. It's about 10 inches in diameter. Um, there is a uh, breakdown of where he got it. It, uh, it, it was in uh, Ashkenazi and co uh, company in San Francisco had it in 1982. It apparently came out of a Parc Bernay sale in 1979. And um, it's been in the Irving collection ever since. But it's just uh, absolutely a uh, su stupendously well-carved piece of early uh, Markham period uh, Chinlung jade. All right, and now we're going to mosey along over to um, the lacquer section. Uh, Mr. Uh, Irving and his wife were big fans of lacquer, not only Chinese lacquer, but Japanese lacquer. And there, in this catalog, there is Chinese lacquer, and there is also there are also some really fabulous pieces of uh, Japanese lacquer, as well as Japanese art prints and other things. They were a very broad, ra wide-ranging uh, family of collectors. They collected good English furniture. They collected Chinese rugs. They collected Japanese, Chinese art, uh, whatever struck them. And they also had a, a, a rather significant collection of early reverse paintings on glass, which uh, we'll get into uh, in a little bit. But also among them was this, this very nice uh, 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 scroll box uh, carved in lacquer. Uh, there are very few of these around. They're not particularly big, not as big as they look in the pictures. But the quality of the, uh, the details of all, all of the uh, immortals on them and so forth is really uh, astonishing. They don't turn up often. There's one of these in the Palace Museum. And uh, there's a, a brief write up here on Taoist immortals. He got this at Spinks in 1982. But then uh, if you push back, there's, there's the, uh, the rain mark on the back, the inscription. Here's the write-up, okay? And uh, uh, Patricia um, uh, uh, Curtin wrote this down at, uh, she's a consultant, private art consultant who works with Christie's. And uh, she did this uh, piece on it and where the other comparables are and talks about how uh, even though um, uh, Chin Lung was a Taoist, I mean, a Buddhist, he adhered to Taoism by tradition um, um, uh, in daily life around the palace and they explained why and the significance of the uh, Taoist immortals. So it's, it's, it's well worth reading if you're interested in this stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of other uh, stupendous um, lacquer in here. Okay, and then we're going to slip, get the page to cooperate, um, over to the bronzes, the Yunnan bronzes, all right, Yunnan province province. The, the, there are two of these in this sale, and you've seen this, these tall cylinder, these tall slender Guan Yin forms before. They come from the Dali culture, uh, which was a, 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 a separate um, a, culture really from the from what we consider China uh, from China it was an independent co country from the Song uh, sort of it was own little domain in southwestern China and they developed these uh, very striking very uh, instantly memorable uh, tall figures depictions of Guan Yin uh, the, the, they didn't they didn't adhere to the mandate of heaven the way they did uh, the Chinese did they they, they adhered to uh, it, uh, the belief that the, they have to follow the Guan Yin um, she was their spiritual uh, leader, so to speak, spiritual god, uh, and this is just one of the uh, one of the bronzes that's in the sale. Um, we've seen these in the past turn up, and they bring a lot of money. And I'll be very curious to see how they do. Also seated is this seated Bodhisattva um, from um, uh, the Dali uh, uh, era too, and this was a, a as I said, it was a, it was a dynasty that ran at the same time as the Song. Okay, it was sort of a competing uh, empire to the south. And uh, there's another image of it. And here's the seated figure. Now, this seated figure is fantastically rare. Um, it is missing, unfortunately. If you look here in the photographs, you can see these, these, uh, these, uh, uh, this fitting on the back. This is where additional arms would have been inserted. Originally, this had more arms. They don't really know how many more it would have had. It, right now, it has four. One one, two up here, and then two, two more down there. So four arms, uh, but as we'll see in a second, these had uh, a lot of arms at one point. All right, now let's see here. Here is the figure seated. It is estimated at four to six million dollars, and we'll see how it does. Um, but these are among the rarest of all bronzes, and here are other examples. 
all right, with the multiple arms. And this figure is just the, uh, the forearms that are built in. It doesn't have the um, applied arms, which, which indicate the, the, how, the, how, the, how the Buddha could do more work than, than an average man because it had so many arms it could accomplish so much. Um, there's a whole bunch behind it. But anyway, there it is. And uh, they're pretty confident in the estimate. Bob Mowry, the uh, former fellow at the uh, um, uh, Sackler, the, the Fogg Museum at Harvard University, wrote the, did the write-up on it. He's a great writer. So if you, haven't seen, if you haven't come over to read it, read it. Read, read everything Bob Mowry has to write. He's, he's a whiz um, on this period, especially in ceramics and bronzes, and uh, a very highly informative uh, author. Okay. And then on to, from there, you have Irving Collection Part 2. This is getting really long, I realize, but this will be a little quicker. Uh, the, the, the Part 2 of the Irving Collection is not only uh, jades, which there are lots of, okay? There's some absolutely stupendous jades in this collection. One of them is this bridge. He bought this from Alan Hartman years ago, the Hartman Rare Art Galleries down in uh, Florida in uh, the 1980s, and uh, I, I don't remember seeing one of these. <laughs> um, I probably have seen them, but I don't recall it. Um, a wonderful white and, uh, uh, white and green jade bridge with, with a peasant with his animals going over a bridge and below it a boat. Uh, how great is that? Okay, and then he, this was bought by the Irvings from uh, Alan Hartman. And uh, here's a, the picture of the, the figure on the bridge. Uh, the detail, because of the way we can upload these now, um, you can really see the detail of the carving and the, and the texture of the jade. It's quite exceptional, uh, it really is. And this is estimated at um, uh, $80,000 to $120,000. It reminds me of that load of uh, really interesting jade uh, boats that went through a few years ago. It's probably done around the same period of these, or maybe it was a year ago. It wasn't that long ago, okay? And then on to um, this. Um, there are more, more, lots more lacquer. Uh, there's a lot more lacquer in here. There's some uh, r really, really good Ming lacquer, whereas these, these uh, ch chi pieces and uh, you can just flip along, go through them. You know, the black lacquer, you've got this very, very good Ming lacquer tray or circular dish, and you can blow it up and take a look at that. Um, the work on here is great. And what's really wonderful about some of this lacquer is you can really get a sense of, of the artistic style of the period, um, which was often carried forward onto porcelain and, 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 and bronzes and and so forth, and on paintings. Okay, this is estimated at thirty to fifty thousand uh, dollars. Pretty, pretty amazing, actually. And uh, then we're going to slip over here to um, this furniture, Chinese furniture. There's a Huan Hua Li uh, cabinet. This one, one of these wonderful round corner cabinets, uh, all in very good uh, quality Huan Hua Li, Hua Li. Nice graining from top to bottom, all the way through this. And there are several other cabinets, pairs of cabinets. Um, and you can just go through them if you're a Chinese furniture buff. Good write-ups on all of them. And all of the furniture seems to be in just superb condition. All of it is um, uh, late Ming Dynasty uh, from what I could see. So um, you want to check all that out. And then on to um, maybe the best brush pot in the sale of all the, of all, all the sales uh, coming up. Um, let me see here. Hold on. Uh, 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 172. Um, this is, no, this isn't the one. It's come, we haven't gotten to it yet. It's a jade brush pot. We'll show you in a minute. But this is the, um, um, uh, the wooden brush pot. This is a late Ming brush pot. Uh, by Tong, uh, 17th century. And you've seen these before. Um, there was one of them in a Christie's or a Sotheby's sale that I think that Philippine for furniture collection uh, that came up a couple of years ago. Everything she bought was from, from Hortzman. Uh, this is a, a, a wonderfully pa uh, patterned one, a uh, nice late Ming example, early, early Qing possibly, uh, with these uh, relief work sort of uh, crawling chimeras and with rue heads on them and all that other business. And it's estimated at thirty to fifty thousand dollars, which is it's just probably right in the range you'd expect to see it. Okay. And uh, oh I realize that Jade is gonna be in the next video I do for the rest of Asia Week because I couldn't get it all in today. I've got a note over here. 
Um, and we'll talk about that when that happens. But one of the things I wanted to touch on very quickly was the, their, the, the Irving collection of reverse paintings on glass. Those of you who don't know much about uh, uh, reverse paintings on glass, um, they had been doing these in Europe forever. Um, but China didn't learn how to make flat glass until the 19th century. So there are reverse paintings on glass that were done in China during the 18th century, but all of that glass and all those mirrors were imported. So what they would do is they would import mirrors into China, and the workshops would go, go to town on them, okay? And um, they would uh, scrape with these, uh, they had these sort of odd instruments, they almost look like razors, and they'd scrape away parts of the, the mirror on the back and then painted in, doing, this is all done in reverse, obviously, and they would paint these beautiful landscape scenes. And these were all painted for export. These were not intended for the Chinese market. You don't find a lot of these in China. All of these paintings on reverse glass pretty much were done for export uh, to the West. And uh, you have that, and you have this, and it was to fill the demand of uh, the West's fascination with China. They found China just to be exotic and fascinating, and people wanted things from there. And these are wonderful uh, early 19th century uh, reverse paintings on glass. In it, you have the spotted deer, and there's some porcelain, some vases, and so forth, figures out on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, you know, on a pier overlooking the water beautifully done and these are these are um, not horrifyingly expensive these are these are some of the best I've ever seen and they're estimated at twenty to thirty thousand dollars each uh, transporting them is a bit of a bit of a trick because they are highly fragile but uh, beyond that what can go wrong okay and uh, then over here there are um, I believe uh, hold on let's see here uh, two The furniture, I meant to say, they have a lot of their English furnitures in this catalog as well. This is an afternoon sale. Here are some more paintings as, uh, in addition to the reverse glass paintings. And a set of these are coming up. These are terrific. And they're only estimated, if you like Chinese watercolors, on, on probably on English paper or Chinese paper. They didn't say. Uh, these, uh, uh, we talked about it in the video. Uh, Josh had that tea picking um, a tea harvesting uh, painting that sold a week ago uh, that went for a thousand dollars. So here's a whole set of people, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, depicted in their costumes. All right, it's a set of six of these, uh, 1830, about the same age as Josh's, with a three to five thousand dollar estimate. These were bought at Spinks in 1992. I think they're terrific. They'd make a wall. All right, also these paintings on the right here are also reverse paintings on glass. Okay. And uh, moving along, trying to wrap this up, there is online um, contemporary clay, Yixing pottery from the uh, Irving collection. Um, they became interested in contemporary Yixing, um, and uh, especially very whimsical uh, 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 teapots. And in here, there's some great examples. There's some dyed Yixing, stained Yixing. There's a few classical forms, but lots of really whimsical ones, as you can see. Uh, all kind, you know, very structural ones of boats and wheels and wagon wheels of buildings, um, old water done like bamboo water pots and so on. So it's uh, those are, that sale is online and most of these are in the thousand two thousand dollar range. So if you collect Yi Xing, you want to take a look at it. All right. And that's it just for a couple of the sales. I'm going to try and get a couple more um, sales together and, and sort the pictures and, and let you see some of the other things coming up because this is by no means, you know, all of it, though I think it's some of the most interesting pieces. There's some other stunningly great items coming up too, including Bonhams and, and, and Christie's and Sotheby's. And then, of course, Doyle's is having a sale. I, didn't, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, you might want to check that out, okay? And... Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll try to get it up for you later this week um, or next week before the sales happen. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.